Legend and Albatross here again with the Cypher Unlimited crew. We have our usual suspects of AD or Alpha Dean. We have Spigs 18 or Anthony. And Dean, what are we doing here today? Well, as usual, guys, you know, we're going to get in here, have us a nice little conversation. And, you know, I guess, you know, Ant was noticing some stuff on the server and we talked about it. So we're going to talk about the top 10 rules and mechanics that seem to confuse new players, new GMs, and people new to Cypher system all around. So here we go, and it's on you. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the CU. I know we were supposed to do our tallest walkthrough, but um, somebody here didn't read the book. We're not mentioning any names. So we needed a new topic. So, you know, I noticed, like I saw a couple of questions in the new GM room, you know, a, a couple of like commonly asked questions. And then I, I noticed that there was a lot of questions, you know, that, um get commonly asked in the new GM and player section on the Cypher Unlimited Discord. If you haven't been there, please do. We got 4,000 members, great place to chat about gaming. So we, I, you know, I decided to compile the 10 most frequently asked questions. And decide, I asked the guys if you want to make a video about it. And everybody said, yeah, let's, let's get, you know, let's make it happen. So we got 10 questions and then like a dumbass, I forgot that there was one question that always get asked and I forgot to put that in, so we added a bo bonus question uh, to the list. So we actually got, you know, 11 questions. So without further ado, and in no particular order, here is the top 10 most confusing rules for new GMs and players first starting out in the Cypher system. The way it's going to work out is I'll, ask, I'll state the question, and either Dina or Al will give us the book definition, and then we'll discuss, you know, because they... You know, some of these um, rule, rules or rulings are up for some sort of interpretation. So, and I'm sure that we'll have different opinions on some of these questions. So that's the way we're gonna do it. So number 10, are you guys ready? Everybody ready? Yes. Number 10, the 10 most frequently asked question is, how do you use flavors in character creation and do they re replace existing abilities? So, uh, you want to read the definition? Yeah, I'll get the definition. That is a question that does get asked quite often. But the definition is, flavors are groups of special abilities that GMs and players can use to alter a character type to make it more to their liking or more appropriate to the genre or setting. For example, if a player wants to create a magic-using thief character, she could play an adept with stealth flavoring. In a science fiction setting, a warrior might also have a knowledge of machinery, so the character could be flavored with technology. At a given tier, abilities from a flavor are traded one for one with standard abilities from a type. So to add the danger sense stealth flavor ability to a warrior, something else, perhaps bash, must be sacrificed. Now that character can choose danger sense as they would any other first tier warrior ability, but they can never choose bash. And that comes from page 34 of the Cypher System Revised Core Book. Alright, so the first thing I'm going to say is I, I think the, the confusing part that um, a lot of new players and new GMs get when they... they you know, ask this question is one, does it replace the the existing ability? And can you take that ability again at a later time? And I I think we both know the answer to that question is yes, it does you don't get an additional ability by choosing a flavor because then everybody would do it. And the key component is is you have to be careful on what you remove from the um you know the abilities of the warrior or whatever um, you're choosing from because you can no longer pick that ability ever. So, you, you know, you you have to really think about what abilities you, you're subtra um, subtracting. The way I look at it is this, and I, I try to get people to understand it, is that that's when you're uniquely making your own character type. It You know, you, you, you're, you need, you're making a new character type. And if you look at it in that vein or that venue, then I think it makes it easier uh, to embrace the whole concept because you're literally customizing the archetype to the player type, I mean, to the character type you want to play. So That's definitely a great well, way to explain that. I actually haven't heard you say that, I don't think, or anyone really. 
Um, and it is, if, you're, if you've read the book and you know what the types are, um, it's easier to understand like, hey, we're actually making our own type just by switching around a couple of abilities. Even just one ability could completely change how the type goes. I mean, based on that, you know, whatever level. But yeah, that's actually a great way to put it. Another question that gets asked with flavors, just to throw it in there, is uh, can I use more than one flavor from a different type? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. As long as you keep on removing abilities from the type, then um, you can, you know, you could use four different flavor abilities if you wanted to, right? As long as you're subtracting an ability from the type, then there, you know, there's no issue at all. It's not going to break anything. Um, yeah. Yeah, and again, well, like, like, at that point, you're basically making your own type. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. I've I've made quite a few types. I've done it, you know, all, across the board. You know, I literally remapped out, like, because I wanted to make a uh, Anthony seen it. I wanted to make a um, Technomancer, yeah. you know, a character that used technology to mimic magic. So I used the adept as the base, but then I did take some technology things. I took some you know, just manipulated to create that specific ideal. And I think, you know, when you start doing that, you kind of free yourself from being overwhelmed because with most things in Cypher, it's subjective and it's very flexible. So. Yeah. And so before oh, we move on to, okay. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, one more thing before we move on. If I don't know if you had anything else to add. Um, that one of the most, or I've seen most confusing parts about it, uh, you know, brought up, at least this is also part of my confusion. Um, and honestly, I will say that I do still homebrew, I guess, like modify run it this way. But a lot of people assume that, or excuse me, I've seen people assume that when you go to reflavor the type, like you take a different ability, right? But let's say you tier up to two, in the example with the warrior replacing Bash, you just couldn't take Bash at tier one. But once you go to tier two, you can go back to tier one. You know, it says take a type ability from a, a same tier or lower. And I was letting people go back and take Bash at that point. Again, no. by raw, that's wrong. And a yeah. lot of people think that's okay. And again, if you want to rule it at your table, that's fine. But by raw, it's wrong. <laughs> right. And and also too, is um, that's a good point. I, it, I was going to say something similar is that you when when you say now you're taking a flavor from tier two right and you're taking something from the stealth flavor you have to remove a tier two ability from your type right. you can't move a tier one ability it has to be a matching ability to the same tier yep. right i mean it kind of says that one for one so you know a tier two ability would be, not be a equal to a tier one ability so and so on and so forth but um, that makes, you know, perfect sense, guys. That's good stuff. Yeah, so basically, flavors are a way of enhancing your character beyond what the normal types give you. And you, and like with any other thing in Cypher system is resource management, you're trading one for one. Always, if you, you get a little confused about Cypher system, you always remember that they do... They tend to do a lot of one for one trades in their design philosophy. So worst case scenario, if you don't have the book, always making a one for one trade is usually gonna um, either be correct or it won't be unbalanced. Right. So yep. the next question, if you guys are ready, right, is this this one actually came up the other day. How exactly do recovery roles work and can you take more than one recovery role in and out of combat? So, uh, uh, Dean, can you want to read the, the quick little definition? So then we'll go into yeah. all. And that definition is found on page 218 in the CSR, uh, Cypher System Rulebook Revised. So, recovering points in a pool after losing or spending points in a pool, you recover those points by resting. You can't increase a pool past its maximum by resting, just back to its normal level. Any extra points gained go away with no effect. The amount of points you recover from a rest and how long each rest takes depends on how many times you have rested so far that day. When you rest, make a recovery roll. To do this, roll a d6 and add your tier. You recover that many points and you can, can divide them among your stat pools however you wish. For example, if your recovery roll is a four and you've lost four points of might, two points of speed, you can recover four points of might or two points of might and two points of speed or any other combination adding up to four. 
The first time you rest each day, it takes only a few seconds to catch your breath. If you rest this way in the middle of an encounter, it takes one action on your turn. The second time you rest each day, you must rest for 10 minutes to make a recovery roll. The third time you rest each day, you must rest for an hour to make a recovery roll. And the fourth time you rest each day, you must start, you must rest for 10 hours to make a recovery roll. Usually this occurs when you stop for the day to eat and sleep. After that much rest, it's assumed to be a new day. So the next time you rest, it takes only a few seconds. The next, the next rest takes 10 minutes, then one hour, and so on in the cycle. If you haven't rested yet that day, and you take a lot of damage in a fight, you could rest a few seconds, regaining 1d6 points plus one point per tier, and then immediately rest for 10 minutes, regaining another 1d6 points plus one point per tier. Thus, in one full day, doing nothing but resting, you could recover 46 plus four points per tier. Each character chooses when to make a recovery roll. Um, and if a party of five PCs rest for 10 minutes because two of them want to make recovery rolls, the others don't have to make rolls at that time. Later in the day, those three can decide to rest for 10 minutes and make recovery rolls. And like I said, that's page 218 of the CSR. So you guys, um, I was just going to talk about why, where I think the confusion lies for new players and new GMs. I think the confusion lies is that uh, the way the rules are worded, it's worded in the sense of in a combat term, like turns and actions, right? And people get confused between in and out of combat when it comes to recovery roles. Like you, like you somehow have to role play the ten minutes of the recovery role. Like, we're like, why can't I take two? If you out of combat, then yes, you could take two recovery rolls back to back and not have to RP it. You could be like, hey, I'm taking my recovery roll, and while the guys are packing their bags and resting, we don't have to RP this. I'm going to take another one. So, you know, people get confused with the, you know, like the, you know, the first one is 10 seconds, the, the second one is 10 minutes, right? Because the turn is 10 seconds, right? That only applies that you actually have to concentrate on it in combat. Because outside of combat, you don't have to worry about RPing the 10 minutes or the, you know, the, the full day. So that there's where the confusion lies, I think. What I do, how I help people with this is a lot of people, of course, because they're coming from D&D, &D, I explain it in the D&D &D terms. Um, your first recovery role, your, your, your one action recovery role, I explain that as how in D&D you get to burn a hit die and recover. You know, um, the 10 minute and the one hour, I liken them to short rests. And the 10 hour, of course, is a long rest, you know. And of course, it resets each day. And I mean, I, I found success with that because like you said, I think people get confused with the idea of being in and out of combat. You know, but let's just look at it from a, you know, a, a application standpoint. In combat, you know, you can take an action and you can say, you know what, I'm giving up my action this round to, to recover, you know, catch a second win. Boom, done. You know, after that, you have to be outside of combat because you can't take 10 minutes in the middle of a combat. So, you know, or an hour in the middle of a combat, you can't do that. And I just yeah. do it that way. Yeah, it, it's very, I mean, I've been playing Cypher System a long time. It's very rare when someone is getting two recovery rolls from the natural recovery roll system right. in one combat. But there are other methods in which you're getting recovery rolls. There you know, is. Ciphers, there's certain abilities that people have that will heal you as well. So that's not the only method of healing, but... The system of recovery rolls itself, it's very rare if I ever see a player get two recovery rolls in, in one combat. Exactly. And there is a, um, just to throw it out there, there is a descriptor, I believe, that gives you, uh, that turns your 10 minute into an action. So that yes. would be one of the, you know, situations well, in which it, you it, would it, see two recovery rolls in a combat. Well, no, there's like, there's, a, there's actually a, uh, one that gives you an additional recovery roll. Well, there's there's also well. a, there's also a cipher that allows you to use any of your recovery rolls as a free as an action. Yeah. So yeah, lots mm -hmm. of ways. 
So there's, um, there's many ways. And then, of course, um, there, I think there are even foci that add stuff in like that. Of course, you like we said, uh, ciphers do it. Uh, some artifacts do it. There's many ways around, you know, recovery. But in the same breath, you know, it, it's to build that tension, you know, throughout the game as well. Because, you know, if, like, you know, if we were doing a, a dungeon crawl, you know, that would be the perfect time that that would actually come into play, you know, because you're over an extended period of time, you and you might, you know, be in a gauntlet where you're, you know, a couple of combats, you know, within 20 minutes of each other or whatever. Now you're going to start feeling the, the, the fatigue because that's what it's going to, you know, uh, represent fatigue and damage and so on and so forth. Um, and the last thing I say about recovery rolls, I touched on it a little earlier, is that outside of combat, though, do what you want. If, if the guys want to burn all three, three recovery rolls, say, hey, yo, your guys are resting in the inn, take all three. Just a new day. Just take, a new day. Take all three of your rolls. Don't worry about it. You, you don't have to play out just because they're taking a recovery roll, the actual time in game. Yeah, really? I mean, unless, unless... And I mean, the only way I'm saying that unless playing it in game is if you have something that's going on that you know is going to be non strenuous per se, where it would e equate to that. If you're just doing a, a big, you know, role play soap opera scene or, you know, whatever, then that would be pretty cool to do. But other than that, yeah, I'm with Ant. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to keep them up, uh, role play it out. You was gonna say something now? Yeah, no, basically that. Just that it's really easy and this is just from as a player standpoint, like when someone's describing a scene that, you know, there's some role playing or whatever going on and you wanna make a recovery role, you wait for that role playing to die down, and you say, Hey, while they were talking or doing whatever, I was putting band aids on, I was rubbing yeah. salves on my wound. That's my ten minute recovery role. It's very easy to just throw it in there. It doesn't have to be this right. elaborate like I'm taking ten minutes and then you just fully describe what's going on. You could just throw it in there as a side note, like, hey, while they were doing this, I put some band aids on. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. All right, so you guys are ready for question number eight. Yippers. Does using a cipher count as an action? And why do we need cipher limits? We hear this one all the time. Yeah, I'll define this one. Oh, <laughs> unless you wanted to read it, Anthony, this time? I don't care. No, you can read it. So ciphers are one use abilities that characters gain over the course of play. They have cool powers that can heal, make attacks, ease or hinder task rolls, or, in a more supernatural or extreme example, produce effects such as nullifying gravity or turning something invisible. Most ciphers aren't physical objects, just something useful that happens right when you need it. They might be a burst of insight that allows a character to make a perfectly executed attack, a lucky guess when using a computer terminal, a coincidental distraction that gives you an advantage against an NPC, or a supernatural entity that makes things work out in your favor. In some games, ciphers come in the form of items like magic potions or bits of alien technology. Ciphers that don't have a physical form are called subtle ciphers. Ciphers that have a physical form are called manifest ciphers. Regardless of their form, ciphers are single-use effects and are always consumed when used. Unless a cipher description says otherwise, it works only for the character who activates it. For example, a PC can't use an enduring shield cipher on a friend. And this is about using ciphers. The action to use a cipher is intellect-based unless described otherwise or logic suggests otherwise. For example, throwing an explosive might be a speed-based action because the device is physical and not really technical, but using a ray emitter is intellect-based. Because ciphers are single-use items, ciphers used to make attacks can never be used with the spray or arc spray abilities that some characters might have. They are never treated as rapid fire weapons. I oh. Okay, dude. Yeah, basically, um, the whole thing with ciphers, um, I think, you know, what the question is, is that, yes, count, using a cipher does count as an action. Um, as Dave explained, it's normally intellect based. But even if it's physically based where you have to throw something like, you know, you're taking your attack action for that round, 
to activate that cipher, use that cipher, and so on and so forth. Um, and as far as why do we need cipher limits, in my opinion, it's to encourage not hoarding. Because if you gave no cipher limits, then people would just, you know, hoard a bunch of ciphers. This way you use them and you, you know, what it, and because they say make them readily available throughout the game, that means people can gain more. You know, at higher levels, it makes more sense, you know, that you might carry more of these things. But, you know, especially at lower levels, depending on how your game is set up, you can have specific um, ideologies why ciphers can't be carried. So if they're physical ciphers, too many physical ciphers interact with each other and can activate, explode, whatever the case may be. Um, if you're playing a game where you're using all subtle ciphers, you know what, guess what, you can only have so much going on at, at a specific time in your head or whatever the case may be. Many ways to, you know, mitigate that particular situation. So there is that, and on top of that, I feel like another reason behind it um, is to discourage, like, I guess, power plays, if that makes sense, where you just hoard up a whole bunch of strong ciphers, quote-unquote, and just dump them all on, a, like, a big, big bad evil. Because, like, where's, <laughs> like, the narrative fun in that is, like, you're just hoarding <laughs> items to just... Pff, one. I mean, again, it's, it might be, like, again... Uh, at higher levels something like that might happen because people can hold more ciphers but again you're a powerful person by that point it would make a little bit of sense but at lower levels when you're like again if you're holding a whole bunch of these things and you're just dropping them on something that's tough it kind of removes any challenge from the player or something like that if that makes sense yeah uh, um to touch on the first part of the question it says it right in the book the action of using a cipher so yes it is an action to use a cipher and I think a lot of times that even gets confused with the most experienced player because the you know you even see it in our streams right and i think all three of us are guilty of this at one point you say hey i'm gonna use this cipher and then i'm gonna do this right and the gm has to be like no wait a minute using the cipher especially when you have a really cool cipher that does something really cool you know inherently you want to be like hey I, I got this blinding cipher and now I want to go sneak and hide because everybody's blinded, right? So, you know, and I think that's where the confusion lies with new players, you know, like, and I think we've all been guilty of that because I know personally oh, yeah. I have. For sure. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I, I mean, we all had to learn and, and, you know, get better at what we're at the craft, yeah. you know? I mean, Cypher System, you know, we talk about it like we're old hands now, but we had to learn too, like everybody else. So, <laughs> you know... And as for the reason why you need cipher limits, I might touch it on a little different than your guys. You don't need cipher limits. But it's the same reasons why these two lovely gentlemen gave you why it enhances gameplay is the reason why we use them. Right? right. So technically, do you need cipher limits? No, but it's going to create a lot of complications and problems over the course of a long run of a game if you allow your players to hoard all the best stuff and not use them and not get new ciphers because it's going to force the GM to slow down the rate of the of how many ciphers they're giving in an adventure. So you're not going to get the cool stuff if you're hoarding everything else. So do you need a do they do we need to have cipher limits? No, but is it fun to have cipher limits or does it enhance the narrative? Yeah. So that's well, why we have cipher limits. And you said, the magic, you said the magic word, Anthony, enhance. Because as Cypher system is designed, it is supposed to uh, allow you to mimic cinematic action, you know, television series and so on and so forth. And you think about it, you know, you watch some of your favorite TV shows and, you know, characters have quote unquote ciphers, but they don't ha always have enough of them or whatever, you know, a, a show like Supernatural riddled with you know the concept of ciphers you know and you know one episode you know they, they've got a vial of holy water and in another episode they got a, a, a goofle bag or something and in another episode so those are the type things too when you start getting into it you know if everybody at the table buys into the cinematic nature of cipher system buy into the idea of you know cipher limits you know and I think it will enhance that cinematic experience. 
You, you know what's funny? I was watching The Librarian the other day. and I, I was like, like this show. And I was like, this is a perfect example of ciphers and artifacts. Because yep. they can't hold like all the cool stuff they get from episode to episode, so they have to bring it back to the library. Because you don't want to... And it's not that they physically can't hold it, but they don't want to be caught with so much powerful artifacts right. or... You know, and have it go into the wrong hands. Exactly. So they, you know, so they'll have they'll travel with one artifact, but you, they'll never travel with more than you know one, right? They'll take it back to the library. So, exactly. You know, that's a way. You know, the narrative also could dictate why do you, why it makes sense to have cipher limits. Yep. All right, this next question is a question that I actually had for a long time myself, and even when I understood the rules i still didn't always agree with them so this day and this question comes up a lot as well though but what's the difference between effort and edge i knew that though but can i apply edge or effort in multiple times in a turn all right so the definition comes do from page first. 15. The de edge de first. excuse me do edge yes. first i am the definition for for the for these come from page 15 and it says edge Although your pool is the basic measurement of a stat, your edge is also important. When something requires you to spend points from a stat pool, your edge for that stat reduces the cost. It also reduces the cost of applying effort to a role. For example, let's say you have a mental blast ability and activating it costs one point from your intellect pool. Subtract intellect edge from the activation cost and the result is how many points you must spend to use that mental blast. If using your edge reduces the cost to zero, you can use the ability for free. Your edge can be different for each stat. For example, you could have a might edge of one, a speed edge of one, and an intellect edge of zero. You'll always have an edge of at least one in one stat. Your edge for that stat reduces the spending points from that stat, uh, from that stat pool, but not from the other pools. You might your might edge reduces the cost of spending points from your might pool, but it doesn't affect your speed pool or intellect pool. Once a stat's edge reaches three, you can apply one level of effort for free. A character who has might, who has a low might pool, but a high might edge has the potential to perform might actions consistently better than other characters who has a might of zero. The high edge will let him reduce the cost of spending points from that pool which means they'll have more points available to spend on applying effort. Do we want to talk about edge before I go into effort? Um, no, we, uh, ah, we the definition of effort and we'll answer them both. All right, so effort. Again, page 15 of the Cypher System Revised Core Book. And effort is defined as when your character really needs to accomplish a task, you can apply effort. For a beginning character, applying effort requires spending three points from the stat pool appropriate to the action. Thus, if your character tries to dodge an attack, a speed roll, and wants to increase the chance for success, you can apply effort by spending three points from your speed pool. Effort eases the task by one step. This is called applying one level of effort. You don't have to apply effort if you don't want to. If you choose to apply effort to a task, you must do it before you attempt a roll. You can't roll first and then decide to apply effort if you rolled poorly. Applying more effort can lower task difficulty further. Each additional level of effort eases the task by another step. Applying one level of effort eases the task by one step, applying two levels eases the task by two steps, and so on. However, each level of effort after the first costs only two points from the stat pool instead of three. So applying two levels of effort costs five points, three for the first level, plus two for the second level. Applying three levels costs seven points, three plus two plus two, and so on. Every character has an effort score which indicates the maximum number of levels of effort that can be applied to a role. A beginning, first tier character, has an effort of one, meaning you can apply one level of effort to a role. A more experienced character has a higher effort score and can apply uh, excuse me can apply more levels of effort to a roll. For example, a character who has an effort of three can apply up to three levels of effort to reduce a task difficulty. 
All right, so let's define the first part of this question and then I'll read the definition of combining um, using multiple efforts after that. So, and it's funny, when I was writing out this question, I, I see Eric Frankhouse has been saying this since day one. Like, why does effort and edge both have to start with an E? Because it's confusing as fuck. And it definitely is. Like, when you first start reading the, the, the rule book, you, you flip, I don't know, I can't speak for everybody else, but most people flip flop effort and edge all the time because they both like very similar words. I have definitely said edge when I meant to say effort, and I've definitely said <laughs> effort when I meant to say edge. I do know how the mechanics work differently, and I know when I when I'm saying it, uh, what I'm trying to accomplish. But again, it's very easy to just confuse those words. Exactly. Agreed. <laughs> I, I think I mean, we've so, all done it. So basically, oh, the you know a, all edges is that it, it helps you improve on one specific ability or role in a turn one only so it's uh you know like if you want to lower the the cost of a, a ability from one of your types or if you want to lower the cost of effort then you could apply that edge to that role you know to that cost am i do i have it correct yes so ba it basically lowers one stat one you know, aspect one, one, one ability yeah one aspect of an ability um, and it's tied to that particular pool. So yes. it has to be, you know, might related to use might edge. It has to be related to might and speed, you know, to speed and so on and so forth. Um, and effort, how would you define effort? Effort is basically that, that, that concept of you pushing. It's you pushing the envelope, you know, how, how hard can you push beyond what your normal capabilities are and you know um effort is a very cool statistic you know it, it's it's a way to give yourself a bonus it puts you in charge of your bonuses in a lot of respects you know um, it's like what i'll just said in chat effort is going plus ultra there it is. You push That's yourself, exactly it is. Push yourself exactly. beyond the bounds of what you could normally do, and it taxes your body, and it's represented by your stats going down. That's uh, how I, I describe it. Most people in the stream know what effort and edge is, but here's where it gets the confusion part. But right? here's the: can I use multiple, eff, uh, mo multiple uses of effort and edge? And on page 16 of the CSR. They actually answer this question. Some people might not find it satisfactory, but this is the answer that's in the book. If your effort is too or higher, you can apply effort to multiple aspects of a single action. For example, if you make an attack, you can apply effort to your attack role and apply effort to increase the damage. The total amount of effort you apply can't be higher than your effort score. For example, if your effort is two, you can apply up to two levels of effort. You can apply one level to an attack roll and one level to its damage. Two levels to the attack and no levels to the damage, or no levels to the attack and two levels to the damage. You can use edge for one particular stat only once per action. For example, if you apply effort to a, a might attack roll to your damage, you can use your might edge to reduce the cost of one of those uses of effort, not both. If you spend one intellect point to activate your mind blast and one level of effort to ease the attack roll, you can use your intellect edge to reduce the cost of one of those things, not both. I think this is, edge is what is the confusing part for new players, because it's the, the, the concept, you have to decide by war, right? You have to decide beforehand where your edge is being spent. You know, if it's an ability, like what Dean said, that coincides with the stat that you have edge in, right? So if, if um, it doesn't really apply so much, the confusion doesn't apply so much in tier one, because in tier one, you usually only have one level of effort and the ability scores don't cost more than what your edge is. But in later, in later rounds, I mean, later tiers, when you have an edge of four or five, 
if you decide in, to use your edge in the wrong area, you actually are losing points by law. And I'll give you an example. You have five edge and might. There's an ability that costs five edge, but you can only use it in one effort, which will be three edge. If you decide to use your edge in a level of effort, you're actually losing two edge points. It's, Does anybody follow me or am yeah, I losing? So, yeah, it definitely, that definitely follows, right? So the way, look, excuse me, you know, the way we played it was wrong. Like, yeah. straight up, well, we'll just be transparent as hell. We yeah. all misunderstood this aspect as as yeah. far as raw goes. The way we were doing it was, let's say, an Anthony example, you have five edge, but let's say the ability actually only costs uh, three uh, might, right? Whatever this ability might be. You have five might edge, three, uh, an ability that costs three might. And you want to use effort for this, right? So by raw, you have to decide whether that five edge is going to the three points for the uh, ability cost or towards the cost of the effort you can't do both the way we've been doing it is let's say you're using the ability and one level of effort with your five edge you reduce the thing to free and then you reduce the level of effort by two that's wrong as far as raw goes you have to choose one or the other uh, it's really it kind of, yeah uh, what, what you point in chat that's how we played it but technically that is not the raw rule yes so it's it's very it's again I personally still play it the way we've interpreted it because I like that better. But as sure. far as raw goes, it's wrong. You have to decide here's where the, the points the, are going first. And, and exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's wrong. But in the same breath, if, if we do it the way we were doing it, you're going to get the most bang for your buck because you can always still get it. For example, I mean, no, I can... let, me, let, me, let, me, let me finish. Yeah. And the, 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 using the same example. You know, if you had an ability that cost three points, but you want to apply two levels of effort to that particular action, two levels of effort is going to cost you five, you know, five points. So with edge, you you just basically reduce the cost of the effort that you were spending. It's now it's a free two levels of effort because you basically applied it, but we just applied it at the end. You no, just no, have to... Dean, I'm going I'm to I'm use the example. Like, it, it doesn't... I 100% agree with you. And you know that I rock the way you rock. Like, oh, the yeah. way you do it is the way I do it. We both know that. Oh, yeah. But at t let's say tier four, right, where the confusion lies. You have an ability that costs six, six um, points off your might pool. You have yes. five points in edge, right? right. You, you are using the ability plus applying two levels of effort on the, um, um, no, let's say you're using the ability plus applying one level of effort with the ability, right? right. Which would be a total of eight points. Correct. The way we would do it, it's a total of eight points, subtract five, you gotta spend, spend three. Right. The, the way it's written in war is the player has the option to decide Right. right, where to spend the edge on, and they must declare it first, right? So a, a new player that doesn't know any better or doesn't want to think in min max terms, right, would say, "Oh, I'm apply, I'm apply my edge to my effort," right? Right. They're actually losing two points. It's it's actually you're actually spending more points than 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 what you call you normally would if you did it the way we did it and not give them the decision, just add it all together and then subtract the edge. And I agree with you. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I do agree that, you know, you know, it would be offset, but at the same time, I, you know, everything guys said, I'm using a two point ability and apply a level of effort. That's a total of five. All right, so Anthony, I think right. your example is a little confusing because the ability that you're stating, this imaginary eight, whatever cost, high cost ability, um, you, it would just make sense to just, you say you're using the edge on that because it, it's a totality of it. But in, it a, yeah, but in a situation where you have two numbers that are lower than your edge, like let's say you have a five okay. edge, you have an ability that costs two, you have your effort that costs three, if you use it in either way, you're losing out. Either way, if you use it for the ability, you're only using two, oh, excuse me, well, however much it costs. Like, let's say the, uh, the ability costs two points. You're only using two of that edge. 
in the way we do it, we add it up, right? So yeah, in, yeah. In, in this situation, the ability that costs two plus your level of effort is five together. With your edge of five, it's zero. By raw, in this situation, you choose to reduce it by two or three by the cost yeah. of the ability or by the cost of the effort, not both. So you're always spending points, which I do not like. I will be straight up. Oh, I will tell you, yeah. I do not like that raw rule at all. Oh, I'm gonna be transparent as hell. I run it the that, additional that's way. That's a way better explanation. But now. yes, th that explanation. that is what it boils down to by the raw. You know what I also don't like about this at higher tiers? It forced players to spam higher tier abilities instead of using lower tier abilities in creative ways. Because again, right. yeah, in that situation, you don't want to lose points. Yeah, exactly. Because you're if you go and use a low level ability. You're gonna have to choose the effort because it costs more, and you're still spending the one point to use onslaught for yeah. levels to, for tier six. That I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's one of the most raw. I def, I do but not but like again, this raw. See, and, and I, I just think it's. I, I really think it's the approach of the thought process because again, either way it doesn't bother me because I look at edge the way I see edge in my mind. I don't see edge quantified like I look at the pool. I look at edge. You know, just like you know. No, but D, you look at it. No, no, no. You looking at it from a narrative perspective. And right, and that's what I'm. That, that's what I'm saying. I. That's why everyone it doesn't, doesn't think that way. You know I'm not I mean? saying everyone does. Yeah. But I'm saying I'm just trying to point it out to people. Maybe an option to get past it, because that's just probably the one thing I don't look at as I don't look at effort and edge, you know, mechanically in that sense. And I think that's why I, I I started doing it the way we were doing it because I remember reading all of this. I'm going, yeah, okay, well, just subtract it at the end. And you know, I even and think I will, I I will say this: at tier one, it makes no difference what right. at how you do it. You tier one, tier two, yeah. tier one, tier two is it, really it, not. It only it only becomes an issue the higher level you go up when when abilities and, and um you start having more edge than one level of effort. So it, you know the cost of one level of effort. So then it does it does give you it goes back to the cipher system is designed to give you resource management and choices. So it is a choice of a choice between two right. things. So it does follow their design, you know, the design aesthetic, the way the way the game is designed. I just think that it's um it's not my favorite rule, just put it that way. Yeah, I mean, and I and like I said our little adjustment doesn't break anything, you know? So for those people out there, we've talked about how it's written, how the rules go as written and the simple, the simplified methodology that we use, like we said, we add up all the points and then subtract the edge, <laughs> you know, plain and simple. And that really will make your life a lot easier, but it's up to you if you want it. You but know. it is not the rule. But it is not, and like I said, it is not the rule. Because me and Al got our head chewed off one time on the server for saying that. Oh, um, and, and, and yeah, that's not the rule. You're giving people wrong information. And before that's the way we do it, before we move on, um, okay, we can talk about it more, uh, if if you want it private, like, because again, it's yeah. it's 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 wrong because you have to choose one. All right, it's like doing a math problem. But uh, either way, I, I don't want to go back into it. <laughs> I'll talk to you private about it. I, mean, I already yeah, forgot what I was going to yeah, say now. That's exactly uh, what Al said. If, if you, if, I gave the wrong example. Al gave the better example. You, you have five edge, right? And you use an ability that costs three, and you apply two levels of effort. One level of effort. Or, or one level of effort on the roll. So you have to decide whether you're going to spend three points or two points. And you're gonna lose out. You can't combine them both. If you added it all together, you will have the benefit of your entire five edge. But if you could only apply it to one, then you either spending three edge or two edge, and you losing out either way. And when you're looking at it like that, right? I yeah. will say this because you reminded me of the point I was gonna make before is there's two very key differences in the raw and how we handle it. Um, by the raw, you're basically at higher levels, always going to end up spending points. Like it's it's going to happen. Yeah. You're going to either spend it on the let effort me, or me, the ability. Let me, it. 
let, let me try to address it because she says she still doesn't understand how it's wrong. Nothing, we never, it's not wrong, Claire. What it is is this. Let's look at it this way. If you had an ability, let's just say you had four edge, and you have an ability that costs um, five points, and you apply your edge so that, to that ability. So that ability right there is now worth costing you one point from your pool, but you want to apply two levels of effort to it, right? Two levels of effort is going to cost you another five points for, for a total of six. Now, in that same example, that ability that costs five points and five points is 10, now it still is four points. No, D, you gave the wrong example. You gave, you made the same mistake I did with my example. You have to do, the numbers have to be not even to, to show the difference. You can't have the same, they can't both be five. Guys, because it's, what, again, yeah. what it boils down to is, again, yeah. by, Let's by, move on. We, we, yeah. we're going down but by the yeah. raw, just before we move on, by the raw, you're always going to end up having to spend points at higher tiers. By right, just, the way we do it, what? Well, yeah we wouldn't spend any points because it just shows how powerful your body is at that point at handling the stress. Uh, and, and to answer the initial question, you can apply effort on, on multiple things. You can only apply edge on one thing. There yes. you go. That was the original question. <laughs> you, you, on effort, you could, you could either do it on attack and damage. You could, you could mix it up. With effort, it's one thing. You pick one thing in a turn, and that's all you can use your effort on. Edge. Edge. You see? <laughs> <laughs> but, Anthony, my example, my example showed just the please, difference. Please, we'll talk about it offline. I'm just telling you, my example did show the difference, but it's okay because one cost no. six, one cost four. Basically, move on. Ten, ten minus four is six, and, and five minus four is one plus five is six. They both cost. No, no, six. no, no. no. Go, go, guys, we should move on. All right, go ahead. Let's go to the next one. All right. You guys ready? Yep. All right. Question number six. How many assets can somebody apply to a row, and what exactly is an asset? This happens. An asset. <laughs> this is on page... I know it sounds funny, but this question comes up a lot. Page 209 of the CSR. <laughs> An asset is anything that helps a character with a task, such as having a really good crowbar when trying to force open a door, or being in a rainstorm when trying to put out a fire. Appropriate assets vary from task to task. The perfect awl might help when woodworking, but it won't make a dance performance much better. An asset usually eases a task by one step. Assets can never ease a task by more than two steps. Any more than two assets from uh, any more than two steps from an asset don't count. So that answers it right there. By raw, you can only have two. Uh, I, I think I think where the confusion lies with new players is that they they confuse abilities and stuff that you get from skills and ciphers as assets. Uh, those are not those do not count as your asset. Like assets if, are outside of your character. Yeah, They're no. Outside. I know, D. That's why I'm, I'm trying to explain where the confusion lies. The, right. the, the confusion lies in the, the fact that someone will be saying, hey, I'm using my ability. Right? I'm helping him. Oh, no, you can't because you only had two assets. An ability is not an asset. Right. So what it really boils down to, and I think this is, again, where a lot of confusion also comes from, is... Uh, when people are reducing um, what you call it difficulties by using skills, uh, newer players or newer GMs assume those are assets as well. Um, yes. I believe skills also have their own set limit by raw how many you can apply to reduce the difficulty of a task, which I believe is two. I could be wrong. Don't skewer me in the comments. But <laughs> if you're going by raw, you can only ever reduce, um, not counting abilities, just assets and skills by four um you know sources yeah. so it'd be two skills and then two assets however many they reduce depends on whether you're trained or specialized and however many you know steps the gm might want to reduce for your asset but only ever four sources two for the skills and two for the assets correct and ability and, and if an ability lowers the difficulty by one task that is a separate thing entirely yep so so when 
and I, and I think I make that mistake as well. Just I'll be like, oh, um, if you have any assets to add, what I really should be saying is if you have anything to lower the difficulty to add, because when, when I use the word asset, it's assumed that it's just that one thing when it's, you know, ability, skills and assets are all separated in three different categories. Yeah, we have to get used to, uh, you know, adjusting some of our, because I think I'm guilty of that too, saying assets, yeah. you know, um, we just have to adjust our language. So we, we, we say the right thing. So for so the, I think that's so, easy enough, guys. It was, hold on, just, so for, just to re reiterate, so the, for the new player watching this, it's two. You can allow two assets, um, you know, um, per role. So and, if you watch this and you haven't played, and the other thing it says, what exactly is an asset? Remember, an asset is something outside of your character. You know, it, it is either environmental, it's another player giving you something, it's a tool, but it's something outside of your character that is going to give you that particular bonus. And just to cap it off, for example, using cover, picking up a rock yeah. to break a window, like... <laughs> Things of that nature. <laughs> yeah. All right, and this, all right, this is another doozy, and uh, this is another one that um, I think every GM in Cypher system, this problem has come up one one point in time or another in any in one of your sessions, right? So, what is the difference between a minor and a major effect, and how do I know when someone is asking for too much? <laughs> This is a great question. <laughs> that is a great question. Go ahead, I'll take it away. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and define minor effect. It's from page 211 of the Cypher System Revised Core Book. A uh, minor effect. A minor effect happens when a player rolls a natural 19. Most of the time, a minor effect is slightly beneficial to the PC, but not overwhelming. A climber gets to the stop. Uh, the top. Ah. The climber gets up the steep slope a bit faster. A repaired machine works a bit better. A character jumping down into a pit lands on their feet. Either the GM or the player can come up with a possible minor effect that fits the situation, but both must agree on what it should be. Don't waste a lot of time thinking of a minor effect if nothing appropriate suggests itself. Sometimes, in cases where only success or failure matters, it's okay to have no minor effect keep the game moving at an exciting pace. In combat, the easiest and most straightforward minor effect is dealing three additional points of damage with an attack. The following are other common minor effects for combat. Uh, damage object. Instead of striking the foe, the attack strikes what the foe is holding. If the attack hits, the character makes a might roll with a difficulty equal to the object's level. If on success, the object moves one or more steps down the object damage track. Distract. For one round, all of the foe's tasks are hindered. Knockback. The foe is knocked or forced back a few feet. Most of the time, this doesn't matter much, but if the fight takes place on a ledge or next to a pit of lava, the effect can be significant. Uh, move past is another action they describe. The character can move a short distance at the end of the attack. This effect is useful to get past the foe guarding a door, for an example. Strike a specific body part. The attacker strikes a specific part on the defender's body. The GM rules what special effect, if any, results. For example, hitting a creature's tentacle that is wrapped around an ally might make it easier for the ally to escape. Hitting a foe in the eye might blind it for one round. Hitting a creature in its most vulnerable spot might ignore armor. Usually the GM just has the excuse me. Usually the GM just has the desired minor effect occur. For example, rolling a 19 against a relatively weak foe means it is knocked off the cliff. The effect makes the round more exciting, but the defeat of a minor creature has no significant impact to the story. Other times, the GM might rule that an additional roll is needed to achieve the effect. The special role only gives the PC the opportunity for the minor effect. This mostly happens when the desired effect is very unlikely, such as pushing a 50-ton battle automaton off a cliff. If the player just wants to deal three additional points of damage as a minor effect, no extra roll is needed. Pretty straightforward stuff. I right, um, <clears throat> you want to read major effect, and we'll go right into it because mm -hmm. I think the, the 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 major effect is actually shorter, and I just have a quick, simple rule for this all right a major effect happens when a player rolls a natural 20. most of the time a major effect is quite beneficial to the character a climber gets up a steep slope in half the time a jumper lands with such panache that those nearby are impressed and possibly intimidated 
A defender makes a free attack on a foe. Either the GM or the player can come up with a possible major effect that fits the situation, but most, both must agree on what it should be. As with minor effects, don't spend a lot of time agonizing over the details of a major effect. In cases where only success or failure matter, a major effect might offer the character a one-time asset, a modification of one step to use the next time they attempt a similar action. When nothing else seems appropriate, the GM can simply grant the PC an additional action on their turn in that same round. In combat, the easiest and most straightforward major effect is dealing four additional points of damage with an attack. The following are major com are common major effects for combat. Disarm, the foe drops one object that is holding. Impair, for the rest of the combat, all tasks the foe attempts are hindered. Knockdown, the foe is knocked prone. It can get up on its turn. Stun, the foe loses its next action. As with minor effects, usually the GM just has the desired major effect occur, but sometimes the GM might require an extra roll if the major effect is unusual or unlikely. I, I, I want to go first on this because I have two short, quick, simple rules that I follow for major and minor effects. In combat, if a, a minor effect affects the turn, whatever is happening in the turn. So an example would be, just to use the cliche, the warrior drops his weapon. In a major effect in combat affects the entire scene. So the warrior drops his weapon and he kicks it down a a chasm and he no longer has access to the weapon. Outside of combat, right, my, my, my little simple rule is a minor effect affects the player that the effect is um, directly related to. A major effect affects the entire party and the scene. So outside of combat, if someone has a minor effect, it, only, it can only apply to them. And, inside, uh, and outside of combat, if somebody has a major effect, it affects their entire party whatever they choose. I actually really like that rule of thumb. I don't think you've ever told us that before. That is a very good rule of thumb for uh, minor and major effects. But I will take it one step further, or I guess extrapolate a little, is um, instead of saying that, you know, your minor effect only affects you, uh, you can, I excuse me, this is how I personally do it. Um, I guess I do it in a very similar way, like, you know, one person versus group, but it's not necessarily has to be you. Like, your minor effect could affect one other person, not necessarily, like, a whole group or a whole situation. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I kind of meant like that. Like, it, it couldn't go past one character. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's not, but, and not just your side. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. You, um, but, yeah, no, it's, that's an awesome rule of thumb. Like, that's super, um, you know, that's something and, and, a new GM could look at and think, hey, that you know, it was what they're asking going to affect this one turn or going to affect the whole situation. And, and, yeah, and that's a quick way to answer. It, it sort of answers the second question. How do I know if my player is asking too much? Well, in my combat, is this go? It's a minor effect. Is is this going to affect past this one turn? If the answer is yes, then they're probably asking for too much. <laughs> That is a really, and um, what you call it, on top of that though, um, when it comes to like uh, outside of combat or narrative stuff, and this is mostly speaking about the uh, natural 20, the major effect, me as a GM, again, this should be a back and forth between the GM and the player. I like to let my players go crazy with the natural 20s. It just makes things more exciting. Players get excited when they roll the natural like Ask for the world. Yeah, I because that's my mindset. Like if I'm rolling natural <laughs> twenty, I want to do something yeah. insane. And then I'm that player at the table that the GM is gonna be having that discussion with. Like, hey, that's too much. Yeah. What about this? Yeah. Um, we, we've had we've yeah. had that discussion before. Um, but yeah, like, you know, with the natural twenties, you definitely want to give the players, you know, that feeling of power. Like, don't talk them down too much. Well, also, as a player, you should be asking for as much as you can. Because one, you might not get it in the intrusion, but you might be giving the GM story scenes or you letting the GM know the direction you want to see the narrative go to. So even if he doesn't, he or she or they doesn't give you what you're asking for, you're still giving them reliable information, important information that they can use later. Like, hey, Al really wants to end up on this spaceship. <laughs> he asked for, you know, so maybe I can make it happen. I'm not going to give it to him right now, but maybe I can make it happen in the narrative later. So shoot for the moon, guys, which are, which are uh, major and minor effects. 
Yes. I, the only thing I, I, I had to say uh, about major and minor effects um, is, uh, once again, you know, I want them to add something to the game. You know, even even with a major effect when or a minor effect when somebody just takes the extra damage. You know what? I'm a purveyor of either describing it myself, you know, what happened, or asking a player, you know what, well, tell me what that looks like. Tell me what that 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 spectacular attack looks like. You know, making the player kind of a part of it. Um, when I'm playing with a lot of new players, you know, a lot of times I'll, you know, ask them, do they want a major or minor effect or do they want extra damage? And with new players, I'll start out by describing minor effects for them. You know, just so they start seeing what they look like. Okay, you know, you're fighting a guy. He tripped over, tripped over one of his allies and fell and fell prone in front of you. Stuff like that. You know, and then you know, show a major effects the same way. But then I know later on, you know, we're all we all do it. Well, you know, what do you want your minor effect to be? You know, once you once you've kind of trained your people, you know, or got people used to the concept. I won't say trained anybody because it's not about that. It's about making people comfortable within the context of what the rules are. So once you get that comfortability with your group and everybody understands major and minor effects, it becomes a really nice give and take. You know what, well, what do you want your minor effect to be? And then I can say, well, let's modify it like this a little bit or, you know, and I know me and Anthony and Al, we all do that. Tell me what it looks like, you know, and then if it's too much, we modify it a little bit and give you this or give you that. So that's the kind of thing that I want to say about it. It's okay, just to touch on the last thing before we move on as a GM, it's okay when you feel like somebody's asking for too much, it's okay to give them half the stuff they're asking for. You don't have to, just because somebody rolls a 20, you don't have to, hell, I tell Al all the time, now that's too much. You can get big. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. Um, we just move on. Are there, right, I have, uh, uh, no, no, no. Are you ready for the next one? Yeah. Yeah. I, th this is a funny question as well, because it, may, it made me chuckle every time I see it asked. But why are skills so vague? And how can, um, can or how can I make up my own skills? Um, I'll read the definition. Sure. I don't know, this is pretty long. I don't know. We need, I think. I can give a, please, like a brief. Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah I can, I can, can summarize it. Yeah, so the, the verbatim uh, definitions found on page 19 of this uh, Cypher System Revised Core Book. But really what it boils down is to um, skills are something that your character is trained or good at. And it reduces the difficulty of what you're trying to do by one or two steps, whether you're trained or specialized in it. There's a ton of different like skills listed in the book um, as far as what some like they, they have suggestions, basically, as far as like, yeah, I think they give you what, Dean, it's what, 22? Something like something that? Something like that, yeah. Um, it's not 22. But again, skills can be, depending on what your setting is, skills can really be anything that falls under that umbrella category. So, for example, if you're taking a knowledge skill, the if you look in the like uh, that section of the book for knowledge skills, that that section, that ability that you get, you know, gives you two knowledge, whatever it is, um, it has a couple of things listed there. But it says, I, I forget if it says it actually verbatim or whatever, but um, you depending on the setting, your knowledge skills might not fall under those listed ones, or you might need something that's more specific, like nautical yeah. knowledge or something like that. Um, and yeah, it's again, it's kind of vague, but it's up to you and the GM to kind of like figure out what makes sense for skills within the setting. Let me let me let me address it a little bit, and I'll put it to you this way. Um, again. Think about skills, think about it as less of a mechanical ideology and more as a narrative ideology. And if you can approach it from that aspect, you know what, watching your favorite TV show or whatever, and you have a character on that show, um, let's take, um, okay, uh, Knight Rider. Uh, I mean, uh, let me, or, or whatever. No, let me, let me, no disrespect to either one of y'all, but you guys are not really answering the question. Why are they so vague? Listen to what I'm saying. I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> They're vague because 
I have to cut you off because Dina talked for 20 minutes before I answered the question. They're vague. And the reason why I'm saying they're vague is because coming at it from the perspective that this is supposed to be cinematic or whatever, look at your favorite TV show. Most of your characters don't have a defined list of skills. They can attempt anything. But we know there's certain things they're good at. Those, and that's what I'm saying, break away from looking at it as a mechanical idea. They're vague in the sense that you can try to do anything in Cypher System, but you have a specific wheelhouse that you're good at that's going to give you that bonus, that training bonus, to reduce the, the difficulty of doing something specific. So if you specifically pick lock picking because you're a thief, you know, then yes, it's going to be way easier, but that doesn't mean um, you can't attempt to, you know, bypass the security system either. <laughs> Um, See, I, I kind of I, I understand where you're going at, D. You're absolutely right, but I, I think they vague in particular from a from a design perspective a little differently. I think they vague in particular one is I think they vague in particular not to hammer down your character sheet with a million individual skills, right? Agree. You you don't have the op from a design perspective. You don't have the opportunity. They don't want you to have fifty different skills on your character sheet. Right. So if you if you generalize specific like mechanics, right, you, you don't need if you if they want you to use the mechanic skill for multiple applications instead of a linear specific like I am an automotive mechanic instead of I could fix a refrigerator if I had to. You know what I mean? Or I could like you know, or I could I could fix a motorbike if I had to. Same thing with driving, right? You know, I could I, I could drive a, a a motorcycle and a car without having to have a specific skill, individual skill. So from a it's just a clean way from a design perspective of not having all these fiddly bit GERP style skill lists or, or you know palladium style skill lists where you you know you literally need a whole sheet to hold each individual skill because. But it, motorcycle, it, it, car, you know, like those will all be individual things. Well, that, that's one of the reasons why I think it's vague. The other reason why I think it's vague from a design perspective is because it, they want to encourage the back and forth between the player and the GM to um, to to discuss what how a skill could be useful in a certain situation, which if you have a hard-coded skill, there is no discussion. I, I have... Air, um, air, um, refrigeration mechanics, I could fix this fridge. When, when if you have just mechanics, you could be like, hey, I could, I, can I use mechanics to fix this fridge? Because before I started working on cars, me and my pops used to, we used to take old fridges from the junkyard and resell them, fix them up and resell them. But again, I think, I think that's also more, not just, you know, design making it easy for the back and forth, but I think it also is more real world because a lot of us have skills that we apply to multiple things in the same respect. You know, that's what I'm saying. That's why I'm just looking at it from the narrative perspective. No, you know, no, you just said it. I, I, no, 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 no. I'm just saying, you just said it in another way, which I was agreeing with you. It's, it's like really cool because yeah. that that's kind of reality. You know, I mean, you know, it just, it just it just works. I think it and so I think it's you know it, it covers both sides the design and the, you know the uh, application. And, and, and I think the reason why this question comes up with new players is because if you don't play a lot of indie games or narrative games, if you play a lot of the popular you know RPGs, they tend to have more linear skill set systems where it's more well defined, and it eliminates. Like, you, you know what it is? Cypher system encourages the back and forth between GM and player as much as possible. And a lot of other systems tend to either save time or eliminate that conversation by having their hard coded, hey, you know, I'm a refrigerator mechanic. I keep on using that because there will be a specific skill on the mechanic. Like you will have, like GURPS will have mechanics and then they will have 90 other skills that are related to mechanics. Cypher yes. system will have mechanics and maybe five other skills. And all those other 90 other skills are comprised within those five other skills. Those five other skills are just to give you an example. <laughs> and, you know, um, 
Claire in uh, the chat said something that's very important to you, which is true. You know, um, you as a GM and players can decide if you want a more specific criteria for a certain skills and terms. So that's literally that's literally the second part of Anthony's question is how you make how do I make up my own skills? Just like that. You can you can if you want to import a skill list from another game, if you think it's appropriate, you can do that as the GM. You know. I'll give a perfect example. I played the heater in Dean's um unmask. We ran an unmask campaign. And my character was basically Alex Keaton from Family Ties. He was a young Republican, you know, like uh really into politics. And one of my skills was Ronald Reagan. Anything that had to do with Ronald Reagan or or, or Reaganomics, that was one of my skills. Was it a, a useful skill? No. Was it a dumb skill to have? Yes. But was it fun to play? Hell yeah, that was hilarious. Exactly. And the thing about it was, too, him having that on his sheet was, was fodder for me. So me and him could have a, a cool dialogue. We actually got into it. We had him get into it with another character about Ronald Reagan. You know, and they're going back and forth, and you know, and he's talking, well, well, you had to see bedtime for Bonzo because such and such and such. You know, it was just great. And those gives you those moments too. So, you know, don't get so caught up in the idea that you need to have a specific list of skills because again, you can try anything at a baseline if you're not skilled in it. You know, there's no detriment to using something you're not trained in. And I will say this before we move on, that um, that is something I see from a couple of newer players, not a lot of the time, is they'll look at their skills listed and assume they can only attempt actions that are related to those yeah. skills. That is not the case, you new players out there. In Cypher System, you are not limited by what is on your sheet. You can attempt anything, anything your heart desires. Your skills just make it easier to do those things that you're trained at. And also, too which is a perfect example, is try to figure out ways to justify your skills in the unconventional means of using, like, you know, that's another thing people, like, I know it's with a newer player, you know, they'll, they'll be like, um, what you call it, um, oh, I, I, I can't do this, I don't have nothing on my sheet, right? And they'll be like, oh, but you have this on your sheet, you, if you come up with a creative way of using that, I might give it to you, at least try, you know what I mean? I mean, we, we've talked about that in the past. You know, we had a character. Uh, maybe it was even one of my games with you, Anthony. Remember, we had the guy that came up, to, you know, instead of using his speed to uh, make his attacks, he used intellect because he was like, oh, he was a mathematician. So he would compute, you know, angles and so on and so forth. Home style. Yeah. Exactly. And so it, it's, it's just being creative, like Anthony said. All right. So, so we up, move on. Yeah, up to question number three. How does armor work? This one is pretty simple. All right. So there is a long definition for armor, but I don't think we need to read that one as well. Um, armor is very simple. It reduces the amount of damage. So whatever the armor is rated at, it reduces the damage by that amount. So, I for think example... Cool. For example, if uh, you had a heavy, uh, heavy sword, uh, you know, does six points of damage, but the person is wearing two points of armor, you know, the instead of doing six points, you're going to do four points. It's going to reduce it like that. Very and, simple. And um, there's different types of armor, which we should yeah. also talk about. There's armor that reduces intellect damage. There's armor that reduces speed damage. There's armor that reduces regular damage or magical damage. Um, I want to say that um, I think the biggest confusion when it comes to armor isn't what you guys said. It's what Adelisk or however you pronounce, sorry if I butchered the name, said in the chat. Yeah. It's the cost of wearing armor oh. that comes into confusion here. Yeah, I, I put the rule in there, so read the rule. Oh, the cost of ruling? Where is it? Yeah, it's on the bottom. Using armor. Okay, using Sarah. Armor. So using yeah. armor, we'll read this rule verbatim. Yeah. Right. So anyone can wear any armor, but it can be taxing. Wearing armor increases the cost of using a level of effort when attempting a speed-based action. So if you're wearing light armor and want to use two levels of effort on a speed-based roll to run across difficult terrain, it costs seven points from your speed pool rather than five. Three for the first level of effort, two for the second level of effort, 
plus one per level for wearing light armor. Edge reduces the overall cost as normal if um, if you are not experienced with a certain type of armor but wear it anyway, this cost is further increased by one. Having experience with a type of armor is called being practiced with the armor. So what that really boils down to is um, your speed effort, and it's, uh, not, not speed action, just effort, becomes more taxing for you because of the armors, this narratively, your armor's too heavy for you to be doing this fast and speedy stuff. So really, again, what it boils down to is you just add one to every level of effort that you're using. So the first level costs four, or excuse me, for light armor. This is specifically yeah. for light armor. <laughs> So basically, it's if light is one, medium is two, heavy is three. So if you have heavy armor on, you add in three to your speed um, effort. If you have medium armor, you're adding two. If you have light, you're adding one. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's it's again um, the confusion again. A lot of people, because um, I think it also comes from confusion from the I think it was the first Numenera book where instead it was um, like per time wearing it you, you you got like it was very hard right. to keep it was, track it of was it. a lot more complicated um, and it became simplified and this simplified version again much easier to keep track of and you just have to remember it's only when you're using speed effort not any speed like let's say you're using um i think danger sense uses speed if you're using danger sense danger sense this cost isn't going up by one but if you're using no. effort for anything or i i, I think you can, can you use effort for for speed for danger sense for speed defense if you want but, to use yes, if yes. you were using it for speed defense you know and anything was, related that's the easiest example of speed and, defense and, and it makes sense in the narrative because if somebody has a full full plate armor on and they're running down a hill and I don't have any armor on it, I'm going to exert way less energy than the person with full plate armor exactly. so if, if that person wants to keep up with me they're going to have to apply effort and they're going to exert more of the you know um you know the physical the uh, physical speed pool just by trying to keep up with me so it just makes sense in the narrative yep again pretty so. pretty straightforward rule and rule and again again the, the confusion was mostly just the cost and again if you just and, remember it's only speed effort you're good to go and it's what what um infinite construct world in chat um regular armor is basically soak so if you have an armor or two it's gonna the first two points of damage is gonna get soaked if it if your armor aligns with the damage type that you're taking. Yep. Yep. So if you, you have physical armor and you're taking physical damage, you got an armor or two, the first two points are gonna get soaked into the armor. So next question in. Eh? All right, here's a here's another good one. We got the last two are really good ones, but we get into the some really interesting questions. Not that the other questions weren't interesting, but these are getting really <laughs> How does the damage track work, and how do you adjust how lethal your game is using the damage track? Well, the definition is on page 218 in the CSR. And yeah, you can read it. It's pretty short. Yeah. And it states, as noted above, the damage track, as noted above, the damage track has four states, hail, impaired, debilitated, and dead. Hail is the normal state for a character. All three stat pools are at one or higher, and the PC has no penalties from harmful conditions. When a hail PC takes enough damage to lose one of their stat pools to zero, they become impaired. Note that a character whose stat pools are much lower than normal can still be hailed. Impaired is a wounded or injured state. And when an impaired character applies effort, it costs one extra point per level applied. For example, one level of effort costs four points instead of three and applying two levels of effort costs seven points instead of five. An impaired character ignores minor and major effect results on their rolls, and they don't deal as much extra damage in combat with a special roll. In combat, a roll of 17 or higher deals only one additional point of damage. When an impaired PC takes enough damage to reduce one of their stat pools to zero, they become debilitated. That's written wrong, but when they have really, oh yeah, I'm sorry. If they reach a zero, they become debilitated. The debilitated is a state of critically injured. A debilitated character may take any may take any action other than move, probably crawl, no more than an immediate distance. If a debilitated character's speed pool is zero, 
they can't move at all. And when debilitated PT, PC takes enough damage to be reduced, to reduce another stat pool to zero, they're dead. Dead is dead. Dead <laughs> is dead. That is accurate. Right. I think the confusion lies here is because people that come from other systems are used to Hit being fully, fully effective from the moment that I until I die. So you're 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 a great fighter. You could do everything until you're dead. You know what I mean? As opposed to Cypher system, you know, you, you gradually, you know, you gradually weaken over the course of using your pools. So, you know, it, it kind of confuses people, you know, which is funny because you can have 100 hit points in D&D &D and go down to one and you can still do all your actions. But the minute you go down to zero, you are conscious and you can't do anything. At least Cypher allows you to um, be able to still operate and do things, even one of your poles are down to zero. I think, I think that's the first confusing part. I, yeah, I, I think, again, um, what some confusion goes to is, um, again, once people are afraid of things hitting zero, of not being able to operate at full uh, efficiency. But again, um, damn, I lost my train of thought. Someone else that bit. I completely forgot where I was going. Oh, I'll, I'll, oh I'll go God. ahead. And I'll jump in while you while you remember. Yeah, really, really um, my thoughts. You know, basically what Anthony said it makes it makes sense. And again, you know, I, I keep going back to the narrative aspect. I know we're talking about mechanics, but the mechanics for cyber system support the narrative. And that and I think that's where uh, another thing people could if you start embracing that concept, then you will be able to kind of jump on the bandwagon so when you start thinking about it you know think about it from the the cinematic nature of, of cypher you know um you're operating at peak efficiency when you start your your game you know and then you know just like in the movie the hero starts off you know he's the man and then halfway through the movie he done fought you know 27 bad guys and you know a couple of lieutenants so now he's impaired you know he's not functioning at his top tier you know by the time he gets to the big boss you know he might be debilitated and that's where you know you die want hard is the perfect example die hard is what well, i was going to say die hard that's the movie because you know by the time he gets to hans Gruber, you know at the end he's limping he's, he's got, got glass in, got glass in his <laughs> feet you know he's you know and he, it's that last dish effort you know it's that last that last herb you know you know that's when he pulls out the the intestinal fortitude cipher <laughs> you know you know and you know the last hurrah and i think if you start looking at it that way it becomes less confusing now real quick to address the other side of the question how do you adjust the lethality of your game using the damage track you can do a lot of different things you know to do with the damage track like that you can say you know certain things will automatically drop you down on the damage track, like getting shot with a gun, as opposed to getting into a fist fight. You know, things of that nature, controlling your narrative in that sense, you can make the game way more lethal using the damage track. So, um, Dean, you did make the point I was going to make as soon as you started talking. That was exactly going to be my point, too, that it feeds the narrative that you're showing your character getting weaker over time is actually awesome. Because, again, it's, you know, we're humans. Most people have limits. Like, you're not going to be fully functional while you're getting hurt and stuff. Like, it's it's just awesome for the narrative. Um, yeah, that, 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 was, that was it. <laughs> so, anything else on this one? Um, yeah, um, so I was going to touch on this. Um, you can adjust the lethality on a damage track is just so you know, like just because you drop down on a damage track doesn't mean that you can't get back on raw. You could do one recovery roll and you could be impaired, right? I mean, you could be de uh, impaired or, or, or debilitated. You could be debilitated and roll a two on your recovery roll and put one point in each and you go back to normal, right? Because all, all you need is one point in each pool to remove that um, damage track off your, you know, off your current state, right? So a, a way to increase the that, um, the how lethal your game is, you can make that they have to get half their points back right. in each pool. 
So, you know, so if you're down to, you know, if you if you normally have 10 points in your mic, you cannot um, bring back your mic to full state until you at least put five points. So you're going to always be impaired until you get half your mic pulled back into, you know, uh, back into. That's one way you can make it more um, lethal. We wrote up, we we did a video on Gritty. On, yeah. on, and um, I actually, there's a, a a page out there somewhere where I wrote up a whole lot of little things to do to make your game more gritty. You know, the example Anthony used, we had that in there. Uh, the example I used, we had that in there. So there's a lot of different ways that you can manipulate, you know, the damage track and how damage works in Cypher to make it more gritty, more lethal. I will also I, throw in just I, I, lasting damage. It's yeah, also a way I, to... And just to answer the first part of the question is, how does the damage track work? It shows it shows you in the narrative gradually over the course of the game how your character is being affected. Instead of going from, you know, 100% healthy to dead, you're going to actually see it in the narrative of how your character is weakening over the course of the adventure or game or, you know, session or scene. No matter... It's gonna it's gonna show it narratively. So and, and pretty much what the guy said, I was just rephrasing it. Well, well, no, and I just wanted to bring up an example because you made a really good point when you were saying about getting one point back in both abilities, you know, bringing you back up to functionality. And a perfect example of that is the Karate Kid. If you look at the Karate Kid, the both 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 versions, the Ralph Macchio version or the uh, Jaden Smith Jackie Chan version, when his leg was hurt, and you know, Mr. Miyagi uses his ancient Chinese secret magic, you know, magic healing. He brings him back up. He doesn't put him at full. He's not completely, you no, know, he's still. His, ma his magic healing was secretly Tiger Bomb. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, but the point I'm making, you know, the point I'm making. He put the Tiger Bomb on him, and again, <laughs> you look at it, you know, you're, he's functional. You know what? He got back some points. He wasn't, you know, completely back on his foot because he was still vulnerable, but boom, he was in the fight and he was able, you know, where before he was laying down, oh my God, I can't go on. You know. So oh, you guys are ready for number one uh, ask question. Before we move on though, I gotta ask a silly question. Is does he actually rub Tiger Bomb on him? Because I haven't seen no, those movies. No. So, okay. no. in the first movie in the first movie. The reason the why I said it, he goes like this. He puts his hands together. Okay. And if you ever, if you ever put Tiger Bomb or something, oh yeah, like, no, I know what Tiger Bomb. That's why I asked him. It's funny. You know, he's, like, he's like, I'm warming up my hands to Tiger Bomb you. You know. And, and then with the Jackie Chan, when he actually puts, you know, flaming candles on you or glass. Or <laughs> All right, number one question, Ed. All right, so number one most asked question, how does player versus player or NPC versus NPC conflict resolution work in the Cypher system? I can read uh, this one. Uh, so yeah. combat between NPCs. This one is the one that gets most commonly asked. Yeah. Uh, when an NPC ally of the PC attacks another NPC, the GM can designate a player to roll and handle it like a PC attacking. Often, the choice is obvious. For example, a character who has a trained attack animal should roll when their, pe atta when their pet attacks enemies. If an NPC ally accompanying, accompanying the party does leap into the fray, that ally's favorite PC rolls for them. NPCs cannot apply effort. Of course, it's perfectly fitting and easier to have the NPC ally use the cooperative action rules to aid a PC instead of making direct attacks, or to, co to compare the levels of two NPCs and the higher one wins. And that's found on page 222 of the CSR. Um, this one gets brought up a lot because people, I guess, feel weird rolling for NPCs. Um, so they don't really know how to resolve it because, again, it's NPCs doing it. And what it says at the end here is how you handle it by raw. If it's two NPCs interacting, you see their levels, and the one with the higher level wins. There's no rolling involved. It's, they're just stronger. Right. And that's um, normally how I handle it, unless... Or or unless this is a piece... I, I, I view it a little differently. I will work by raw if it's unimportant to the story. But if this is an NPC that is very 
beloved by the characters and his life matters to the narrative, then I'll allow the players to roll. Right. And I'll just use the head-to-head -head combat in the example. So if this NPC is a level three and he's rolling against a level five, they both roll in D20s, but the level five is added six to their roll. And the players can apply assets to uh, help the NPC out if they want to. Yeah, it works. Because I was yeah. never a big fan of if if because I was that's what I wasn't a fan of the shit com the early shit combat rules either of if it's a higher level it automatically wins that's kind of that's yeah. kind of not good story not good narrative I always well, yeah, like I, said, I agree with you if it's if it if it's like you know this invading army versus that invading army that's one thing you know but like you said if it's if it, if it's you know, a player's, you know, NPC, companion, whatever the case may be, will make the rules. That makes perfect sense. You know, and even like with the early ship rules, I've made adjustments to those too, because like I said, I don't think we, uh, I think we had those discussions before. Yeah, um, no, that's what I'm saying. If, yeah, if they're unimportant to the story, then it just happens. If the oh, NPC okay. is important to the story, I make them roll it out. Yeah, and, and so the next part of this, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I was just going to say, like, I always defaulted, you know, personally, even though I know the raw, to having someone roll, even if it's like, you know, just people like rolling dice. I was like, who wants to roll for this NPC? Like, people will jump at the chance of it instead of just, right. you know, it becomes just a fun part of the game. Like, who's going to roll for the NPC? Like, And it also like, makes the NPCs more memorable because yeah. you can have a high level NPC that the person that rolls for them always rolls bad. So if you don't <laughs> want to be in this... From, from being the super cop to the worst cop in the force because every time Dean rolls for him, he can't get higher than a three. Yeah, that's you know true. I mean? So it changes the narrative, you know, and it adds fun to the story. Yep. So now we have the special situation. Combat yeah, player, between yeah, player versus player. When one PC attacks another PC, the attacking character makes an attack roll, the other character makes a defense roll. Adding any appropriate any appropriate modifier. If the attacking PC has a skill, ability, asset, or other effect that would ease the attack, if it were made against an NPC, the character adds three to the roll for each step reduction, plus three for one step, plus six for two steps, and so on. If the attacker's final result is higher than the attack, the attack hits. If the defender's result is higher, the attack misses. Damage is resolved normally. The GM mediates all special events. Yo, Dean knows my love affair with contested roles as a game mechanic. So I absolutely love this. This is so simple and easy to do. Your guys want to fight each other. You both roll D20s. You both add, uh, every time you add effort or skill or asset or ability, you add in three to that role and it goes a contested head-to-head -head role. Very yep. simple, very elegant, very smooth. And normally what I do, even with that, I take it one one step simpler for me is I tell them, before you make any roll, you know, declare, yeah, yeah. You know, declare your effort or your assets or whatever. And in that way, that's totaled up. So, oh, he's got, you know, two levels of effort and the asset. So that's nine points. You get to add nine points to this roll. Let you know, me, oh. you're, you're... You know, as someone who grew up playing riffs for so many years, the contested roles always put a smile on my face. Oh, yeah. Uh, let me <laughs> interject here just for some, I guess, personal anecdote or, like, how I see it. So, again, it does say combat, but contested roles can happen between PCs, not just in combat. It could be anything. So, yeah. let, let me use an oh, example yeah. of, like, because, yeah, I just, like, again, I, I like being clarifying because this is specifically saying combat. No, no, um, no but that's because I pulled this specific, it was under the, but there is another special situation. Oh, okay, and, gotcha. And so, it's, okay, it's the same exact yeah, way. So it's, yeah, it's the same thing, right? So, let me just, again, <laughs> let's just give a quick example just to illustrate the point. Um, in my home game, back when I was playing with my coworkers, um, it was typical fantasy. We had a rogue, we had a paladin, we had a mage. Um, the rogue always wants to do dumb things. Always. That's what rogues are want to do, or want to do. So anytime he wants to do something silly or dumb, or, you know, that the party members consider dumb, 
they would interject like, hey, whoa, whoa, wait a second. And then that would be a contested role to see whether this guy gets to do his stupid thing or if the, the other PC actually controlled his action. Because most of the time, the action that's being contested is something that would put the whole party at risk. So it yeah. would make sense to give them the opportunity to prevent it with these contested roles. And exactly. again, that, it, it kind of goes back to like a real life example. In real life, if someone's trying to do something stupid, you would try to prevent them. But depending on how adamant they are, they might overpower you and still do it, <laughs> you know? Well, I, I think I want to clarify something as well. Um, initiative still has to be rolled because what oh, yeah. I mean by contested roles I don't mean that they both doing the actions they want to do at the same time is there'll be an initiative the person that goes first decides their action the person that's trying to stop that particular action whether it's dodging or parrying or you know in the case of combat they roll against that and then the second person gets their action so if it's a fight one person tries to hit the other one the other one either parries or dodges. Then the other person gets to go. They try to hit them. The opposite person parries or dodges. Just so so there's some clarity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, again, it it is uh, again a lot of people see that like contested role as like a like a dirty word because you're like pitting the you know team against each other. But I will say this: my home game had the most contested roles I've ever seen in any game ever. And it added tons to the narrative. It made things super fun. Like it was amazing. It was a, it was just Some, downright amazing. Do not shy away from contested roles should they present sometimes themselves. Sometimes inner party conflict can be the spice of the game. You know, sometimes that inner party that inner party uh, dialogue, conflict, discussion, whatever you want to call it, becomes the spice of the game. And your story takes a second or a back seat to this care it, be, it truly becomes a character driven <laughs> event you know in that respect yes. I mean, from, <laughs> from a design perspective i love how simple and easy this mechanic is right you, you're applying the same thing you, you apply in any other attack role you, the only thing is that you reverse it instead of lowering the difficulty you adding three to your role right yep, that's basically exactly. the same exact math in, but in reverse yeah yeah. adding instead of subtracting but like you just add the three per the thing like just that you're yeah. worrying about increments of three which is again vital to the cipher system um but so yeah finally, the bonus question yeah this is a bonus question this was my brain fart question i should have put this in the original 10 i don't know what i would have took out but this question gets asked freaking all the time all the time i think this is the most asked out of all the questions how do I know when I need to roll for a skill, ability, or a cipher? This is a pretty easy one, actually. Um, it's It really boils down to, is the action you're doing, is are you taking it on something that doesn't want that thing to happen? If that's the case, you have to roll. If the person's willingly willing to get hit or accept the effects of the cipher or the skill you're trying to do, there's no roll needed because they're willing. And again, just to uh, illustrate the example further with an extreme, let's say your paladin or your healer is trying to heal a party member. The party member could say, no, I don't want to be healed. And it becomes a contested PVP role. Um, mm. Or you could be trying to heal an NPC that doesn't want to be healed. Then you have to roll to heal them versus some difficulty number the GM sets. Even if it's a positive effect, if the creature or whatever does not want it to happen, it becomes a roll. The only caveat I add to that, Al, uh, is unless the ability, cipher, or skill states otherwise. Because there's some abilities and skills that say, hey, anyone between levels three or below automatically get affected by this. Yes. There is no role. But other than that, you're absolutely right. That, and that, say, oh, go ahead, Dave. I was just going to say, I'll say it this way. It basically stated in a book, anywhere you see it says action if it says it's an action it takes an action to activate so on and so forth those require roles as well you know that that's just another way to look at it if you see that you know that's, a, that's not entirely true because there's buffing to actions there's that a lot, don't, there's yeah. a lot of things to take actions that 
that uh don't require, require roles. roles like um and, and just any, any speaker any, abilities in the and, beginning yeah, that buff the party any, like <laughs> um but what you call it what really matters again essentially is if you're attempting to interact with something that doesn't want you to do the thing you're doing you have to roll for it and again unless uh, the ability specifically states otherwise where and again this is true for like any role-playing game system specific beats general yep and the, the, the perfect example that this comes up with all the time is enthrall. You know, enthrall's ability, anything levels three or below automatically get affected. Anything above that has to roll because you, you're basically, you know, um, what you call it, freezing a, a person or a creature in place until your, until your ability ends, right? Nobody, nobody in their right mind good, bad, or indifferent, we want to be frozen in place, so you have to roll, right? But there's also a side rule to it that if you're level two or below, it automatically affects you. That's definitely an excellent example that we see brought up a ton. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I think that's, you know, we pretty much summarized, or not summarized, but we hit the nail on the head for that bonus question. Um, and all these but that questions. That is probably the most commonly asked question. It, it really is asked yeah. quite often. Do I need to roll yeah. for this? Like, I think one of the most recently asked ones on the server was onslaught specifically. Someone's asking, like, yeah. do I need to roll for onslaught or does it just deal the yeah. damage? And again, it's an attack, so you roll for it because the dam the guy doesn't want to get hit by onslaught beam, right? Yeah. Unless again, there are situations where an NPC might want to get hit by, it and there's no roll. You tell them, yeah. hey, that NPC is not going to move out the way; it's just going to get shot. Like, and then there's no roll. Oh, and also too, we should mention this because you could also also drop it down to no roll by effort, edge, skills, abilities. You yeah. know, oh, like, right. like every other thing. If if you could drop the target number down to zero, you still don't have to roll. Yep. But normally, if you can't do that, then yes, you have to roll. Yep. Yeah, I think we're we're good. <laughs> I think that so was a pretty I, pretty good discussion. Yeah, if there's any questions, and I'm sure there are a bunch that we missed, please let us know uh, in the um, chat down below. The, the, um, yeah, the doobly-doo down below. Let us know what we missed or let us know where we might have messed up at. You know, and uh, we'll definitely, what you call it, uh, correct that. And, uh, they, and no, I know, I'll say this now, I know that the crafting rules in New Era, Ooh. there's a lot of questions, but... <laughs> The three of us are not experts, and you got to go to Claire and Infinite Kasha for that. Um, they might be able to help you out better any way that we can. So uh, um, check Claire's uh, videos on that, because we're definitely not touching that with a 10-foot pole. Um, and all I'm going to say as an Indian for tonight is, you know, again, everybody, thanks for watching. Uh, the Darkest House is out, and Tolis is out, and Diamond Throne just had a great update. And uh, the playtest materials for Claim the Sky are out. So there is a lot going on in the Cypher system realm these days. Yes. And I'm busy. <laughs> so, hey, everybody. <laughs> it's crazy. Dude. If you like us and you like what we do, please visit the Cypher Unlimited um, merch store and pick up some of this cool Cypher Unlimited merch. Or drop us a little donation on Kofi. Like we said, our videos will always be free, but every little bit helps. You know, it helps us out with little things like Zoom course. Or go to our YouTube channel, like, share, and subscribe there. We're really trying to build up our, our um, YouTube uh, viewership count up. So we really appreciate it if you go there and, you know, give us a, a su subscription there. Or give us a follow or subscribe here on Twitch. We really appreciate that as well. Oh, go to our, 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 join our Facebook group. You know, um, it's, it's quickly growing. We have, a, you know, three, 400 people there discussing all things Cypher system related, Monica Games related, Visible Sun related, anything MCG we there to talk. Or if not, last but not least, join our Discord. We have the largest fan run Discord for all things Monica Games. We have games being run daily. We have play by post games, Luminera games, The Strange game, Gods of the Fall game. You, um, what am I missing? We'll soon be claiming the sky game. Predation. Whatever's, out, whatever's out by MCG, there's probably a game being run there, Invisible Sun. So, and you get to talk to all of us. Um, we're all there daily. So if you have a question, you can always ask us a question there directly. And last but not least, we love you guys. Yeah. Uh, Anthony, you're a trooper for always 
coming through with that long message at the end but yeah thank you guys so much <laughs> uh thank you guys so much for stopping by it's been a blast as usual um yeah edge gate continues like claire said we'll talk more about that but in any case thank you oh, so much oh that uh the first of next month we're appearing on infinite constructs channel because we, we're going to terrorize them with Cypher Unlimited as players and Claire's game. <laughs> I, I have no idea what Claire has in store for us, but I feel bad that they're going to be playing with the three of us knuckleheads. Yeah. <laughs> so definitely be, be sure cool. to check that out when uh, when we do that. It'll be on the first, I believe. Yep. Poor, poor Claire. Yeah, it's going to be a blast, though. It's going to be a blast. But yeah, before I keep things uh, much long on much longer, um, thank you again so much for stopping by. Um, and yeah, from us at the CU, we will see you later.